Welcome back to All Things Money. I'm your host, David Blaine. Thank you for joining us today. It was a great show. If you missed the first two segments, head on over to the web, www.dlblaine.com. There's so many good uh, topics to cover. I, I want to get into our continuing our discussion of the economy and simplifying the economy for you, but these issues with the pensions uh, are, are out there, and I felt like it was important to cover it. So let's just wrap up on this. Back in 1999, the state of California said that no increase over current employer contributions is needed for these benefit improvements, that the state pension would remain fully funded. This proposal, known as SB 400, claimed that enhanced pension would, cost, wouldn't, would not cost taxpayers a dime because of healthy investment returns. And so they made all these really generous, retroactive uh, benefits available to people in California. And uh, Governor Gray Davis signed it in fair disclosure. It was a bipartisan support. And so since then, they've only made 75% of the returns they thought of, and the pension system is in a mess. It's costing taxpayers a tremendous amount of money. And one of the things that, that I wanted to point out is that the, you know, it wasn't the taxpayers' fault. It wasn't these retirees' fault. It was simply the politicians trying to gain favor with the unions and voters by just giving them this money. And they failed to disclose a couple of things. One, that the state was on the hook for deficiencies if any actual investment returns fell short of assumed returns. They assumed, the, the, the assumptions they made implicitly forecast that the Dow Jones Industrial Average would reach about 25,000 by 2009. Uh, it barely made 10,500 that year, and that it would make 28 million by 2099. Well, it's just ridiculous to assume anything out to 2099. I mean, the, the world may, may not even exist in 2099. It's ridiculous. Um, and the potential caps to the cost to the state were uncapped, and that members of CalPERS board, the California Pension System board had received large campaign contributions from beneficiaries of the legislation. And of course, so it's a big disaster out there and it's once again assuming that these investment returns are going to be much higher than they were. And this is a very common problem both at the federal and state ledger level. Politicians in their rush to please the unions and taxpayers uh, assume these vastly unrealistic investment returns. Anyway, that's, we'll wrap up with the pension system right there and move on to our simplified explanation of the economy. A quick review, we talked about economic activity and financial market activity are due 100% to changes in money, credit, and the number of items sold. And we see that the creation in money and credit is much easier to control and has a bigger impact than the quantity of, of items sold. And so... This is what causes your bubbles and your, and your cycles. It's caused by this um, easing of money and credit or tightening of money and credit, and it causes these, these various cycles. Now, we have the short-term debt cycle, which is also a short-term economic contraction cycle, otherwise known as a recession. And th so a recession is really just a short-term debt cycle contraction. And then we have, fortunately, much, much less common, the depression. And a depression is the uh, long-term debt cycle uh, contraction. And so we see in these short-term debt cycles, the recessions, we see that the growth rate in spending of money and credit exceeds the capacity to produce. And so then you have when the central bank starts raising interest rates and you have this cr contraction in private sector debt growth um, because of the contraction of money, monetary policy, you have these short-term recessions. And it generally ends when the bank uh, lowers interest rates to stimulate demand and create uh, growth. And what this does, it reduces the uh, debt service through either by lowering the interest rate, it lowers the debt service. And also, here's the indirect. You heard about the, the Bernanke put and the stimulation is by lowering the interest rate, it lowers the discount rate, which raises the price of financial assets, such as stocks and bonds, through the manipulation of the discount rate. 
Now, the long-term debt cycle, in, in contrast, is where debts are rising faster than income. So you have the short-term cycle where the growth rate in spending, money and credit, exceeds this capacity to produce. And then you have a long-term debt cycle that, where you have debt rising faster than incomes and money growth until debt service just becomes excessive and the, the aggregate debt cannot be serviced by the, the income of the aggregate population. And so this is the long-term debt cycle. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very often. Um, it's what we're in right now. And it typically happens because interest rates um, you know, are, are at rock bottom and you have this people buying more assets than their incomes can afford. And so this leads typically to a deleveraging. Now I want to point out one thing that a deleveraging it, a depression is the economic contraction phase of a deleveraging. However, not all deleveraging have to be depressions, and that's important. I don't want everybody to panic. But a deleveraging, which is at least in the private sector is what is happening now in the U.S. as well as other parts of the world, is where people are reducing their debt burdens via either write-downs, the bank just writes off the debt, you know, foreclosures, things like that, modifying the interest rates, um, uh, postponing the, the, the principal repayment or interest payments, modifying the loans, or changing the interest rate. So you have this debt reduction as part of a deleveraging. The second thing is austerity. You know, people just stop spending, uh, whether it be federal government as they're doing in Greece or, or individuals. You know, they just stop spending is what we typically call austerity. The third way that deleveragings uh, play out is a redistribution of the wealth. And what a buzzword that is today. You hear a lot about that is this transfer from people that have money to people that don't have money that are in over their heads through the, mostly through the tax system, uh, this redistribution of wealth. It's a way to, to deleverage an economy, is take the money from people that have it and give it to the people that don't. And then, of course, the fourth way to the, sort of the ultimate deleveraging is to monetize the debt, where countries either simply default or they print uh, more and debase the value of their currency. And we see this a lot in third world countries. Well, that's a little bit more information. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for today's show. Come back next week and we'll continue our discussion about economic cycles uh, in, in the economy. So for All Things Money, I'm your host, David Blaine, and we'll see you again next week. The proceeding was a paid program. The opinions expressed are not necessarily those of WNBU and Interbanks Media.